The first writers in residence came to the James Merle House 25 years ago, shortly after James Merle's death in 1995. Since then, over 80 writers have visited Staying in His Home, a National Historic Landmark, to work on projects of their own. Thanks to Merrill's generosity, the house now belongs to the Stonington Village Improvement Association and is an ongoing inspiration for writers and poets from around the world. For more information, visit our website, jamesmerrillhouse.org. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Bergen. It is uh, lovely to see the James Merrill hidden study of 107 uh, behind you. It's very nostalgic. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Thanks so much. So this is, um, this is my, my new book, it's called The Math Campers. Uh, my own novel, uh, it's called These Women. It looks like this. Well, the first thing I'll say is all the dreams are actual dreams. Um, there's nothing worse than a fabricated dream. You can always tell. I normally don't write in first person because of the fact that as soon as you have a narrator, you tend to have somebody listening or there's an implied audience. I just got to soak up in the atmosphere in that house. You just feel like a writer and you feel like you're part of this um, tradition in a community and it feels like the work is important. Magical things happen when you're looking at Meryl's books. Well, it was a really, really transformative uh, residence for me. Um, it, that might sound like a bit of an overstatement, but it, it, it really wasn't. Meryl's really distinct imagination was present Thanks. in every detail. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> Bye. Enjoy Stonington on my behalf. Welcome to the 16th James Merrill House Annual Lecture. My name is Randy Bean, co-chair of the James Merrill House, and I'm pleased to be your host this afternoon. It was an early 2016 that I reached out to James Merrill Advisory Board member Lanny Hammer, editor of the recent release, A Whole World, The Collected Letters of James Merrill and Merrill Biographer, for the purpose of planning that year's lecture. I had just read a vibrant and original new novel, A Brief History of Seven Killings, and asked Lanny whether he knew the author and, we, and whether we might invite him for that year's Merrill Lecturer. Lanny's response was that the author, Marlon James, had recently been awarded the prestigious Man Booker Prize and was unlikely to be available due to many demands on his time. Lanny instead steered me in a different direction, recommending distinguished poet Louise Glick as the 2016 Merrill Lecturer, which we then secured. Louise Glick delivered a spellbinding reading and in the fall of 2020 was awarded the Nobel Prize in Literature and today, five years later, we're privileged to be joined by Marlon James. Call it an embarrassment of riches or having one's cake and eating it too. Marlon follows in the footsteps of not only Louise Glick, but also other notable Merrill lecturers of recent years. Carl Phillips, Claudia Rankine, Lori Moore, Mary Jo Salter, and Jeffrey Eugenides among them. Unlike previous years, this year we are again unable to gather in person. Fortunately, with the benefit of technology, we bring the Merrill Lecture to a wider audience in a virtual format. So thank you for joining us today. Marlon James was born in Kingston, Jamaica in 1970 and is a graduate of the University of West Indies. He is the author of four novels. His 2005 novel, John Crow's Devil, was a finalist for the Los Angeles Times Book Prize for his first for first fiction and the Commonwealth Writers Prize and was a New York Times editor's choice. His 2009 novel, The Book of Night Women, won the 2010 Dayton Literary Peace Prize and was a finalist for the 2010 National Book Critics Circle Award. His 2014 novel, A Brief History of Seven Killings, 
won the 2015 Man Booker Prize and was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award, as well as being named a New York Times notable book. His recent book, Black Leopard, Red Wolf, was a finalist for the 2019 National Book Award for Fiction. Marlon is currently teaching at McAllister College in St. Paul, Minnesota, and is, divides his time between Minnesota and Brooklyn, New York. Marlon will also be an October 2021 Mellow, Merrill Fellow right here in Stonington. It gives me great pleasure to welcome Marlon James. Thanks, Randy. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. So um, as I mentioned, a brief history of uh, seven killings. Uh, read it a few years ago, was very excited about reading it and would love to, um, actually I wanted to share uh, a, a brief um, critical review that really sets the stage. Mm -hmm. It says, a brief history of seven killings is a masterpiece. Hinged around the 1976 assassination attempt on Bob Marley in Kingston, this massive poetic novel is a gripping, riveting read, intuitively original, deeply erudite and intelligent, told from multiple points of view and unravels the lethal world of mid-1970s Jamaican politics. So uh, we'd love to hear a little bit from this yeah. moment. Um, first of all, thanks so much for, for having me. I feel like I'm cheating because I can already talk about the James Merrill house because I've been there. <laughs> Uh, a, a few times, I felt like I can already give a testimony to being inside James Merrill's room. It's, it's. Um, I think I told somebody it's like being in a room with happy ghosts. Um, you know that, uh, and and the, the the spirit is is so much here. So I'm very happy. First of all, grateful to be a Merrill Fellow, and I'm also very very grateful to be you know, doing this lecture, giving this this reading. Um, I think I'm going to touch on all, probably a few of my books, but for Brief History, for the, for those who don't know, Brief History of Seven Killings is about the assassination attempt on Bob Marley in December of 1976 when I was six years old. And the, the ripple effects that that one assassination attempt had on a whole, pretty much a, almost a universe of people most of whom have never even been in much contact with with Man Marley himself. And I thought I'd start reading from one of the characters in the book who we never see um, we never see come into any actual contact with Marley um, herself. And she's not even necessarily involved in any way in the plot to kill Bob Marley. But I wanted to show how one single event can have repercussions on so many people. Um, so the character's name is Nina Burgess, and in this scene, she's so desperate to leave Jamaica that she is basically stalking Marley. She is hanging outside his house across the street, has been doing it for days, and almost everybody who knows her has seen her. So her sister, um, Kimmy, is one of the people who have heard about the embarrassment of their sister who came from a good home standing outside this Rastafarian's house. And if you're not Jamaican, you may not know that back in the early 70s, um, Rastas were, were, you know, not just frowned upon. They were, they were, you know, they were subjected to horrific acts of violence. They were hated. They were despised. A person would rather you be dead than be a Rastafarian. So it was, it, so, the horror that that Nina Burgess's family and friends are experiencing at seeing her waiting outside a Rasta's house is, Im uh, you know, is, is immeasurable. They're thoroughly disgusted. So her sister calls her. Um, the only thing you need to know about this scene is, even though the sister has called her, she takes forever to get to the point because she just doesn't even want to bring it up. And she has her own reasons why. I'm going to. So most of this scene is, is pretty much dialogue. It's a phone call. Nina Burgess. Phone rings. Hello? Well, praise almighty Jaja. It seems you finally wake up. It's the third time we're calling the sister in. This is my sister, Kimmy. Two sentences in and she's already playing ghetto. I wonder if the sun is up yet. I don't know if I'm up for either it or her this morning. I was really tired. Too much party last night. You hear me? 
I said you had too much party last night. You're not going to ask me what you must take for it. I already know. You already know what you must take? No, I already know you're about to tell me. Oh, what a way you faced it this morning, sistrin. Not used to you being so smart. Must be the morning air. Kimmy makes a point out of never calling me. Ever since she took up with Ras Trent, who told her to keep her communication with people still trapped in the Babylon shits them as little as possible. He escapes such communication by flying out to New York every six weeks or so. Kimmy's still waiting on a visa to go to New York with him. You would think that Ras Trent, son of the Minister of Tourism, could arrange a visa for his queen woman. You would think the same queen woman would read something into him not even bothering to try. But everything in Jamaica is up for sale, even an American visa, and I have things to do today. How can I help you, Kimmy? I was thinking the other day, what do you know about Garveyism? You call, you call me at 8.45, 8.45 a.m., Nina. It's soon 9 o'clock. Nine. Shit, I have to go to work. You don't have a job. Still, I have to shower. What do you know about Garveyism? Is this a radio quiz? Am I on the air? Stop tech things, make joke. Then what else could this be? You calling me so early in the morning for no reason other than a civics lesson. My point exactly. That you wouldn't see it as important. That's why the white man just don't press you so. When we say Garvey, your ears should prick up like a dog. You talk to your mother today? She's fine. That's what she said. Mommy need to levicate her life to the struggle. Only then she can truly escape our down pressure as her people. Kimmy learning from her boyfriend to take the words English people gave her as a tool of oppression and spit them back in her face. Rastafarians don't deal with negativity, so oppression is now down pressure, even though there is no up in the word. Dedicate is livicate. I and I, well, God knows what that means, but it sounds like somebody trying for their, for their own holy trinity but forgetting the name of the third person. All a load of shit if you ask me. And too much work to remember. But nothing Kimmy likes more than being given too much work to do. Especially when Rastrand, looking for power, probably another woman, not a queen like her, but a woman who will suck him off and maybe eat him out, so that no, no, no turns into oh, 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 a bulkhead that he doesn't have to respect. Kimmy wants something specific, but she'll never ask, preferring to fish it out. And this morning, who knows? He's a national hero, I say. At least you know that. He wanted black people to go back to Africa. Well, in a way, but good, good. He was a thief who buy a ship that couldn't sail anywhere, but probably not the only national hero who was a thief. See, you know, who tell her that he's a thief? That is why black people can't progress, you know. They call him own people thief. I didn't know Marcus Garvey's real name was Burgess, or is our real name Garvey. That is exactly what T say. That is exactly what him said people like you would say. People like me? Yeah, people like you. People in darkness. Come out of the darkness and into the light, sistrin. I could try to shut her up, but like Ras Trent, Kimmy's not really look, listening to you. She's not really talking to you. She only needs a witness, not an audience. And why call me since I'm sure I'm not the only person who's in darkness? Call one of your high school friends or something. Sistrin. If the revolution ever going to happen, it must, you hear me? It must begin in the home first. Tres, trends home free already? Everything is not about T, Nina. I have my own life too. Of course. Everything is about Marcus Garvey. Where do you think your life going? All you black people running around like headless chicken and don't even know why you're directionless. You read Soul and Ice? How much I can bet that you never read Soledad, brother? How Europe underdeveloped Africa? You are always the bookish one. Well, book is for wisdom. Yeah, but the problem with a book is that you never know what it's planning to do to you until you're too far into it. I really need to take a shower. For why? You don't have nowhere to go. And why don't you go fuck yourself, miss? I couldn't fucking breathe for Che Guevara, so I go and take whatever revolution I can ride next. It reaches the very tip of my tongue and vanishes like a sugar pill. I tell myself... That I tolerate Kimmy because she could never survive me even once talking to her the way she talks to me. I hate people like that. People you have to protect while they keep hurting you.
Deep down, she's still the same girl who wants more than anything for people to like her. The only thing she wants more than that is to go back and be born poor and struggling so she can feel entitled to hit everybody who lives in Norbrook. But one day, she's going to push me too far. I keep telling myself, I don't have time for her. But I went with her to one of these Rasta gatherings. Can't remember when. The same week we went to a party at Bob Marley's house. The whole trip on the way she's there, she's talking loud, shouting over the engine of a Volkswagen about what I'm supposed to do and what I'm not supposed to do and how I better not embarrass, herself, her, embarrass her with any Babylon fuckery. She shouted about how when I reach, I'm going to get swallowed by the positive vibration and levitate myself to the struggle for black liberation, the struggle for Africa, and the struggle for his imperial majesty. Or maybe I'm already too trapped in iniquity to get swallowed by anything positive because Rastafari must begin with a fire, a fire deep inside you that you can't quench with a glass of water. And you can't wait until it seep out your pores like sweat. You have to tear your mind open and let it rage out. That might just be heartburn, I say, the last joke of the night. She gave me that I expected just a little more look from you that she either inherited or studied from mummy. It's a good thing you dress like a righteous woman, at least, she said, at the most boring outfit I could find. A long purple skirt that brushed against my ankles when I walk, and a white shirt that I tucked in. Slippers, because I can't imagine Rastafarians liking their women to be in high heels. I couldn't even remember why I agreed to go. I know I didn't, but Kimmy was acting as if she had a quota to fill, like those church cult boys on the university campus who act as if they're going to get whipped if they don't get X number of converts a day. But people funny, boy. When we get to this gathering on Hope Road in a house that looked like slaves used to get whipped outside it, two floors, all wood, French windows and a veranda, Kimmy is quiet. The whole ride over, she couldn't stop yapping. And once she was there, she turned into a nun with a silence vow. Rastrant was already there talking to a woman, excuse me, a daughter, and smiling more than he was talking, stroking his beard and tilting his head left and right, while the girl, white, but with a Rasta cap, clasps her hands like she's saying in a heavy American accent, I am so happy to be here. Me? I am so happy to watch Kimmy make sense of it all, to watch her fidget and lean on one leg, then the next, then the first, as if she doesn't know if she should walk over there or leave or wait for him to notice her. All the time, she's silent. All the women were silent, except for the white one talking to Trent. If it wasn't for the red, green, and gold, and the skirts are, and that the skirts are often denim, I'd think I was surrounded by a Muslim woman. Far off in the corner, three women are lit up by a bonfire they have, they have going, cooking some idol food, whatever. I couldn't help it. I'm watching everybody. I'm looking for boys and especially girls from my high school who formed the true light of Rasta, but are really just here to give their uptown parents grief. There's just so much sex you can have with a man who doesn't use deodorant or a woman who doesn't shave her armpits or legs. Maybe to be a real Rasta, you have to be into all of that sort of stuff. A lot of women and they're all moving. It takes me a while to see that they're all getting something to give the men, food, a stool, water, matches for the weed, more food, juice from big igloos, livication and liberation, my ass. If I wanted to live in a Victorian novel, I at least wanted men who know how to get a decent haircut. Kimmy was still beside me, fidgeting, a different woman from the one who spent an entire car ride talking like she's better than me. Sort of like what she's doing with this phone call, but I haven't heard anything she said for the past 10 minutes. I know. I glance at the clock above my door. Channeling, channeling emotional energies towards constructive racial interest, mass sacrificial work through education in science and industry and character building, stress on mass education. And at, you listening to a word that I'm saying? Huh? What? No, sorry. Trying to swat a fly. A fly? What kind of nastiness in your bed? I'm not in bed, Kimmy. Should I even be calling you that? Thought Rastrant would have given you something other than your slave name by now. It, him call me Mariama, but that's just between him and me and whoever free. Oh, that don't mean you that don't mean you can use it until you choose to be free, sister. So now that you're free, are you going back to Africa? 
typical. Same thing T said. Back to Africa is not even the chief aspect of the Garvey philosophy. Kimmy would never use words like chief aspect. Come to think of it, neither would, neither would Ras Trent, who probably spells daughter, D-A-W-T-A, in order to use fewer letters. Amazing that she brings out such a bitch out of me, but it always comes right above my, my skin or inside my mouth and never comes out. The more Kimmy dances around an issue, the more it must be truly bugging her. You call me for some other reason other than history, Kimmy? What are you talking about? I'm telling you, revolution have to start in the home, not the bed. Same thing. I want to tell her that I'm sick of being the one person she feels she can talk down to. I really do. And then she says, you is a dirty little hypocrite. Finally. Pardon? You, you fuck him? What are you talking about? You think nobody wasn't going to see you? Lay, lay around him house like some groupie? I still don't know what you're talking about. Shelly Moo Young said she was sure she'd drive past a woman that looked like you hanging outside Bob Marley Gate yesterday afternoon when she went to pick up her kids. Brown skin girl in Uptown, of course, lots of people look like me. When she passed back with the children, she saw you again. You spoke to your mother? Me know that you fuck him. Fuck who? Fuck him. Him? That is none of your, so it's true. And now you lay with him like some prostitute. I'm going to stop there. And yeah. Yeah, that was great. That was fabulous. <laughs> um, you know, one thing, you know, when I first opened the book, I saw that you have a cast of characters at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And I think I counted them yesterday and there was 76. <laughs> was it your idea to put that up front or did the editor? I think it was my idea because... I had never in I, the, the funny thing is I with brief history I actually I'm not I'm not even lying I really tried to write my shortest novel I was the first time I deliberately tried to write I deliberately tried to control the length of a book and I I remember I was reading a lot of these really quick quick and bloody crime novels mostly from Jim Thompson and this French guy Jean Patrick Manchette. And I love the idea of a noir story, 180 pages, get in, bam, 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 done. And I kept writing, trying these, these novels, and I just couldn't get anywhere with them. I kept, you know, I'd reach 50 or page 50 or 60 or 70. I just was out. I just couldn't figure out what to do. And um, I'm a friend of mine, Rachel, who's actually no longer with us, sadly. But I had dinner with her, and I said, I don't know whose story I'm trying to tell. And she said, what makes you think is one person's story? Hmm. And that was two, and I realized two things there. One, I wasn't writing five different novellas. I was writing one novel. And two, because I know it was never one person's story, I just knew the cast was going to be bigger and bigger um, and bigger. It's, it's because ultimately, and I didn't notice when I started writing the book, because the first page that I actually wrote is now on page 458. <laughs> I had no idea that what I was eventually writing was a Cold War novel. And if you're going to go into the Cold War, it's a big story to tell. Wonderful. And, and before we move to uh, Black Leopard and Red Wolf, I, I actually have a postscript, and maybe this is the benefit of being old. Uh, <laughs> in June, on June 8th, 1978, I saw Bob Marley in Boston. And oh, really? I remembered the year, but I had to look up the date. And the thing that I noted was that that um, program was actually recorded uh, visually and uh, and the sound, and it was released in 2014, 2015, as the uh, Bob Marley Boston Music Hall Concerts. Yeah, did you find yourself in the audience? <laughs> I, I didn't, I, I haven't seen the, the film yet. I just <laughs> I, I didn't realize that, so. Um, and, and it also noted that this was his first uh, full tour after the uh, assassination attempt. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, three years later, he was no longer with us. Yeah, it's the, the cancer progressed really, really fast. And I think a lot of it, too, was um, Bob, Bob started to not listen to people. Um, and, you know, part of it, of course, was a paranoia from, you know, people who 
who um you know who thought were devoted to him trying to kill him bob knew everybody bob knew all the men who tried to kill him he knew them he knew who it was um and i think he started to sort of not take advice um this is is it's, and, and i mean and even in the 70s we knew a lot about cancer we, we, we and and and, we, and treatment was a lot, had already already gone to a pretty decent stage if you took care of it and um he did things like you know somebody thought they could just cut cut a piece of his skin out and graft something else because it was melanoma and and you know that didn't it didn't happen you know the the thing about the that book that drew me to it, it would, more than anything it wasn't just the attack on Marty, it was also the attack on his house because if uh if jamaica at the time especially the road that bob marley lived on his house was this weird kind of sanctuary people who are trying to kill each other only a day before we would be playing dominoes there you go to bob marley's house and at any given time there is you know there is um the prime minister of jamaica uh you know and somewhere nearby is anna wintour from vogue somewhere else is mick jagger and then down the road is somebody who just killed seven people mm. <laughs> and it was this sort of thing and so the attack on his house was also an attack on a certain kind of jamaican ideal which is one of the things that drew me to it i again i didn't live anywhere near marley i didn't live and my parents were both cops and they live anywhere near there but and i was seven five no i was six when he was shot but i distinctly remember it being the first time both of my parents were actually t scared interesting i'll come back to this in quest in questions later but um you know i saw a lot of parallels in some respect to uh the the series the wire if you ever mm -hmm. saw the wire on hbo in terms of the richness of characters but um we'll come back to that later mm -hmm. um so black leopard red wolf um how did you come to write that and can you uh share some yeah. of that with us yeah um black leopard red wolf point of started started actually as a fight uh it was an argument i was having with somebody i think it was maybe 2009 2010 it was not far from when i i actually hadn't even finished um brief history writing brief history yet and it was um they had announced the cast for the lord of the Rings sequel the hobbit and i was of course you know i was like here we go again why couldn't this be more diverse casting um why you know everybody in it is white such and such and, and he pushed back saying well you know it's it's he thought i was being just pushing for political correctness and that it's it's a uh, you know lord of the rings is based on british and celtic mythology it's set in such and such and it's based on those things european things and i looked at him and i said you know lord of the rings isn't real yeah that, <laughs> that um you know, you really can do whatever whatever you want with it. Um, I should have added as a postscript because I gave the J.R.R. Tolkien lecture a few years ago, and trust me, the Tolkien family would have been excited about it. And I said, you know, if 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 the film had opened and there was a there was an Asian Hobbit, nobody would care. And then I said, you know what? Keep your damn Hobbit. <laughs> and that sent me off not reading, not writing actually, but reading because it's it's um. The thing that struck me about Lord of the Rings and a lot of fantasy is fantasy comes from a bedrock of mythology. And that if you know your myths, you can write, you can spin them and you can adapt them and you can turn them into, you can create new mythologies from them. I realized in that instant, I didn't have any. I had folklore and I knew what I did from researching African history, but mostly in the context of slavery. So what I went looking for were my mythologies, um, because I do believe, uh, you know, Margaret Atwood is absolutely right. She says human nature hasn't changed in a thousand years. You know, how do you know? Check the myths. Hmm. And I was like, but I don't have any myths to check. <laughs> so, so I went finding them. And of course, and, and, and I don't know if this happens to every writer, but steeping myself in the mythologies, the story just happened. And that's really how it happened. Great. We'd love to hear some. Yeah. So I'm going to read, I, I, I'm going to, you know, what I'm reading is a sort of an origin narrative. The, the main character who tells Black Leopard Red Wolf is this character, Tracker. 
And what you should know about um, Black Leopard, Red Wolf, it's part of a trilogy called Dark Star. And in this trilogy, you know, spoiler alert, a child who's supposed to be a king is dead. And some people have to answer for it. And um, the novel, the three novels are actually three different eyewitness accounts. So it's not a part one, part two, part three. It's more as if Rashomon were three different films where each novel a different witness tells us what happened. Um, but each novel begins with a witness talking about themselves, how, you know, their origins, how they got to this place. And I'm going to read two origin narratives, one from Black Leopard Red Wolf and one from the sequel. And this character's name, his only name is Tracker. We never learn his real name. And this is him. This is a story about him just growing up. My father came home one night smelling of a fisherwoman. She was on him, and so was the wood of a bower board, and the blood of a man, not my father. He played a game against a binga, a bower master, and lost. The binga demanded his winnings, and my father grabbed the bower board and smashed it on the master's forehead. He said he was at an inn far away so that he could drink, tickle women, and play bower. My father beat the man until he stopped moving, and then he left the bar. But no stink of sweat was on him, not much dust, no beer on his breath, nothing. My father was lying. He had not been in a bar, but in the den of an opium monk. So father came into the house and shouted for me to come from the grain shed I was living in, for by now he had banished me from his house. Come, my son, sit and play bar with me, he said. The board was on the floor with many balls missing, too many for a good game. But my father was looking to win, not to play. Surely you know Bao, priest. If I must explain it to you, four rows of eight holes on a board, each player gets two rows. Thirty and two seeds for each player, but we had fewer than that. I cannot remember how much. Each player put six seeds in the Niumba hole, but my father placed eight. I would have said... Are you playing the game Southern style, eight instead of six? Well, my father never speaks when he can punch, and he has punched me for less. Every time I placed a seed, he would say, capture and take my seeds. But he was hungry for drink and asked for palm wine. My mother brought him water, and he pulled her by the hair, slapped her twice, and said, your skin will forget these marks by sunset. My mother would not give him the pleasure of, his, of her tears, so she left and came back with wine. I smell for poison and would have let it be had it been poisoned. But while he was beating my mother for using witchcraft to either slow her aging or hurry his, he missed the game. I sowed my seeds, two to a hole right to the end of the board, and captured his. This did not please my father. You took the game to Imtaji phase, he said. No, we're just beginning, I said. How dare you speak to me with disrespect? Call me father when you talk to me, he said. I said nothing and blocked him on the board. He had no seeds left in the inner row and could not move. You have cheated, he said. There are more than 30, 32 seeds on your board. I said, either you're blind from wine or you can't count. You sowed seeds, I captured them. I sowed seeds along my row and built a wall, and you have no seed to break. He punched me in the mouth before I could say another word. I fell off the stool and he grabbed the bower board to hit me the way he hit the bingo. But my father was slow and drunk. And I've been watching the Angola masters practice their fight craft by the river. He swung the board and seeds and sent, sent them scattering in the sky. I flipped backwards three times like I saw them do and crouched down like a waiting cheetah. He looked around for me as if I had vanished. Come out, you coward. Coward like your mother, he said. This is why it brings me joy to disgrace her. First I'll beat you. Then I'll beat her for raising you. Then I'll leave a mark that both of you remember that she raised a boy to be mistress of men, he said. Fury is a cloud that leaves my mind empty and my heart back. I jumped and kicked my legs out in the air each time higher. Now he hops like an animal, he said. My father charged at me, but I was no longer a boy. I charged at him in a small house, dived to the ground with my hands, turned my hands into feet, flipped and spun my whole body like a wheel with my legs in the air, spun towards him, locked him with my two feet around his neck and brought him down hard. His head smacked the ground so loud that my mother outside heard the crack. She ran inside and screamed, Get away from him, child. You have ruined both of us. I looked at her and spat. Then I left. There are two endings. 
my phone just started to dictate. I'm going to turn it off. <laughs> there are two endings to this story. In the first, my legs lock around his neck and broke it while I brought him down to the ground. He died right there on the floor, and my mother gave me five cowries and sorghum wrapped in palm leaf and sent me away. I told her I would leave with nothing he owned, not even his clothes. In the second ending, I do not break his neck, but he still lands on his head, which cracks and bleeds. He wakes up an imbecile. My mother gives me five cowries and sorghum wrapped in banana leaf and says, leave this house. Your uncles are all worse than he. <laughs> my name was my father's possession, so I left it by his gate. He dressed in nice robes, silks from lands he had never seen, sandals from men who owed him money, anything to make him forget that he came from a tribe in the river valley. I left my father's house wanting nothing that reminded me of him. The old ways called out to me before I even left, and I wanted to take every piece of garment off, to smell like a man with funk and stink, not the perfume of city women and eunuchs. People would look at me with the scorn they say for swamp folk. I would step into the city or the bedchamber head first like a prized beast. The lion needs no robe and neither does the cobra. I would go to Ku where my father came from, even if I did not know the way. My name is Tracker. Once I had a name, but I have long since forgotten it. Stop there. Excellent. Now, is this part of a, um, a series that you're it's planning? Sort of and sort of not. As I was saying, it's a trilogy, but it's not, the novels don't continue each other. In fact, the second novel um, is called Moon Witch, Spider King. The second novel starts 177 years before the first novel. So it's really more three, and a, a, a really, you know, a, a tragic, terrible event has happened. There are three witnesses, and an investigator is getting their testimonies, their depositions. So Black Leopard Red Wolf is the first one from somebody who's directly blamed for this child's death. The second one is from uh, a woman who many think is a witch who tried to stop it, who tried to save the child. Uh, at least that's her version. And the third is a secret. <laughs> <laughs> but that's how it is. I, I, one of the things, we, we were just talking about me going back to African mythologies and storytelling. And one of the things that fascinated me, two things that fascinated me about a lot of ancient and, and Af African stories was one, how there is no sort of um, beginning, middle and end. Mm. Um, that a lot of times these stories move sort of associatively instead of linear. That, and, and this has passed down in African American and, and Jamaican traditions that you will realize somebody's telling you the same story every night with one or two things changed. Mm. Um, that um, a lot of the stories, if you know, even though with Anansi stories and Bro Rabbit stories, a lot of the stories, the main character is a trickster. Or the trickster is telling the story, so you can't quite trust it. Um, this is leading to my second point, which is that the, the burden of truth, the burden of truth was on the belief of the, the listener as opposed to the authority of the storyteller. So mm -hmm. there is no authentic version. There is no director's cut. You know, the, that sort of, let's boil something down to the truth, which is a very Western thing. It's not there in these stories. So I'm not at any point going to tell the reader which of these three books is true. <laughs> Yeah, there's no fourth. There's no fourth volume coming in where the person go. What really happened was, I'm you know, uh, it's it's and hopefully it will, it will be pulled off. The reader is gonna have to decide who's telling the truth because I'm not doing it. I mean, maybe I'll 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 I'll, I'll raffle it off for charity 30, 40 years from now. But that's the thing because the the that sort of here is this story. Here is the truth. Is something that um just wouldn't be there in that story in the, that, that type of storytelling uh, you know it's it's i don't want to answer it's not like i'm in the q a section already so i can maybe <laughs> i can save this for later but it's um it's it's a hallmark of that storytelling that the burden of deciding truth is on the reader mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. would you like to uh share something yeah why now so this is this is not um 
this is I'm keeping a secret from my editor because it's, it's, it's certain hasn't been published yet. And um, the the one of the, the the person who's telling the second novel, the second novel is called Moon Witch, and the person is called the Moon Witch in the novel. And the Spider King um, is a derogatory term given to the king because he has a he has an, a he has a, a, a sort of a chancellor who's who really has the power. So between the chancellor's four limbs and the king's four limbs, they call him the Spider King. Um, he thinks it's a compliment. He doesn't realize it's a diss. So this is also her origin narrative, and her name is Sogolon, and um, she is if for one of she is a very simplistic read. She's the villain, one of the villains of the first book. So it says something that she's telling the second novel. So this is just her. This is a, um, her childhood. One night, I was in the dream jungle. It was not a dream, but a memory that jump up in the sleep to usurp it. And in the dream memory is a girl. See the girl. The girl who live in the old termite hill. Her brothers three who live in a big hut sit at the hill look at the rotting heart of a giant turned upside down. But she don't know what any of that mean. The girl, she's pressing her lips tight in the hill's hollow belly. The walls are red mud and rough to the touch. No window unless you call a hole a window, and if so, then many windows. Popping all over and making light cut across her body, up, down, and crossway, making heat sneak in and stay, making wind snake around the hollow. Termites long leave it, this hill. A place nobody would keep a dog, but look how this is where they keep her. Two legs, longer but still two sticks. Head getting bigger, but chest still flat as earth. She might be the right age before her body set loose, but nobody bothered to count her years. Yet they mark it by every summer, which bring with it rage and grief. They, her brothers. That is how they mark her birth, oh. At the time of year, they feel malcontent come, on, come as a cloud upon them, for which she is to blame. So she's pressing her lips together because that is a firm thing. Her lips as tight as the knuckles she's also squeezing. Resolve set in her face to match her mind. There, decided, she is going to flee. Crawl out of this hole and run and never stop running. And if toe fall off, she will run and heel. And if heel fall off, she'll run and knee. And if knee fall off, she will crawl. Like a baby going back to her mother, maybe. Her dead mother who don't live long enough to name her. See the girl. Watch the girl as she hear. It is through her brothers yelling about when to plant millet and when not to plant corn that she learns season from season. Days of rain and days of drought tell her the rest. Otherwise, they just drag her out of the termite hill by a rope bound to the shackle they keep her on her neck, tie her to a stick and push her through the field, yelling at her to plow the cow shit, goat shit, pig shit and deer shit with her hands. Dig into the dirt with your hands and mix it deep with the seeds so that your own food, which you don't deserve, can grow. This girl is born with penance on her back. And to her three brothers, she will never pay it in full. Watch the boys. Her brothers, the older two laughing at the youngest one screaming. Boys like they were born, wearing nothing but yellow and blue straw pads on the elbows and shins. The younger of the two, the younger two both wear helmets that look like straw cages over their head, heads. The girl crawl out of her oven to watch them. Her oldest brother spin a stick as tall as a house. The two brothers laugh at the youngest one's face. Not far, the, the little girl, she watch it. Not from because he still don't understand, but because he do. She see how he grabs the stick, how far he pulls back the stick, how far, he, how hard he strikes. Right in the middle of the back, the middle brother scream. The older brother spin around and quick smack the youngest brother on the forehead. They walk off, leaving the youngest bawling. But as soon as he see that nobody is watching him, he stop crying. The little girl creep back in the hut, walking with purpose, but walking with care. We wait for mother to scream four times. This is what they, we do, said the oldest to her. Day gone, but night not yet come. He yank her chin twice to allow her to come out. Palm wine is spinning in his head. Yet it's the only time he allow her out of the house. We wait for mother to scream four times, he said. 
Scream four times mean it's a boy. Scream three times mean it's a girl, but mother didn't scream. The brother is telling a story, but palm wine make him tell it with no form. You see my father, you see his pride when his mother's belly, when mother's belly start to push forward. Three sons soon to be four, and if it's a daughter, then he can marry her off and get rich or sell her if he get poor. Your brother's watching your father count till the baby was born, for she gone to hear a child at the mother's, bear child at the mother's house. All of us waiting to hear news of a boy. But your young brother the most, for finally he can be older brother and do things older brothers do. Your father wait for news, but he also resting, for finally he listened when his wife said to him, husband, this small house will not do, and make it bigger he do. Knocking on walls in the grain keeper and making room for the two oldest boys and for the grandmother, who he hate, but he cannot allow to live alone. We wait for mother to scream, he says. Four times, four screams, then we would enter the house. But four screams didn't come, and three screams don't come either. We wait. When we get to grandmother's hut, the baby, she come out foot first with a bird cord around her neck. My daughter bleed and bleed until she bleed out, then her eyes go white and gone. Little devil, mother slayer, you is like the one speck that drive the whole eye blind. Look how you bring down curses on this house. My father took to weeping one morning, dancing the next, and screaming at night to the gods for their wicked sport. We speak to the priest, he said. We, wear the, we, we speak to the priest, he said. We wear the amulet. We invoke the gods of thunder and safe journey. We don't eat fat or bean, or meat killed by the arrow. So why do gods bring tribulation on us? She rejoiced in her belly. She rejoiced in her husband. And we don't even lie with each other for six moons. So why do gods bring tribulation on us? Why when we pour libations and give praise to the goddess of rivers who control the water in her womb? Nobody call him mad until one day we seem curling upside down in the dust eating dirt. After that, mad is what we call him. The third day after birth is the naming ceremony, but nobody come and nobody go. Nobody name you for you is a curse. And the only thing that birthing a curse, the only thing worse than birthing, giving birth to a curse is to name it. For every time you call it, you invoke it. So no name for you. Also this, nobody spit crocodile pepper in your mouth to prevent you from becoming a shameful woman. And nobody make you a necklace of iron to cut you off from the world of spirits. Another night, when the girl feel the tug of chain around her neck, the tug turned into a pull, then a yank right out of her termite hill, a yank so fierce she burst through the entrance. So the yanking go through the mud and the dirt and the chicken shit, and almost breaking her neck until she grabbed the chain. She flip around to see nobody pulling her, but she hear a slither. A giant python hitch her tail to the chain as she moving to the house, and not knowing that she dragging the girl. The girl, she fearing what pythons do when they get to the house of sleeping people and not wanting harm to come to her brothers, but no scream come from her. All she do is watch. But then the python tail slip from the chain. Not slip. The tail gets smaller and smaller as if the snake is sucking in herself. The tail suck, in, the tail suck into the snake and the snake get wider, bigger, like a caterpillar for such movement is rumbling under her skin. The white and yellow lumps twist and stretch and turn and roll until two hands burst through the skin and tear the whole body open. The skin slip away and a naked woman rise up. This woman don't look back once, just head to the house. Several paces behind, the little girl sit in the dust and dark and listen to the silence until a man's cry comes from her brother's room. Louder and louder this cry, loud enough to make her leap to her feet and run to the window, which is too high for her. An oil lamp light the room dim. On the floor is her brother, and riding her brother is the python woman. She jumping up and down like she's trying to catch something, the brother jerking and writhing like somebody's beating him rough. Then he yelled that she finished him, he dead, and his whole body collapsed on the floor. Then he start to cry. While through all of this, the python woman is saying nothing. Nobody come here but this whore witch, he say. I not no whore nor a witch, you just cursed, she say. You and your brothers and your mad father and your dead mother, so cursed that only whores come near you. 
You should kill the girl, the Python woman say. Try to kill her already, but she come back, the brother say. The little girl, she nearly fall off the stool. Let's stop there. Thank you very much for those riveting readings. <laughs> Um, we're going to open it up for questions and answers, but maybe I could start with one. Um, in brief history, you um, start in kind of a realistic mode or a realistic event, and then in Black Leopard um, and subsequent writings, you move into mythology, uh, and maybe they're all intertwined. But um, any um, any thoughts on the the how you evolved? Yeah, you know, brief history is in a lot of ways, I guess, the most for want of a better phrase, realistic novel that I've written. And yet it's anchored by a ghost. Um, you know, the first character, the first character everybody reads in the novel, the first character you read in the novel is a ghost. And um, so even, even then, reality as we may decide, define it, maybe social realism is just not something I buy into. Um, you know, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, it's interesting if we, we, when... You know, people call Gabriel, Gabriel Garcia Marquez magical realism, a term he never really liked. And it's only when you read his bag, his autobiography, Living to Tell the Tale, you realize just how strange this world is. Um, you know, he always said the reality of the Caribbean is greater than the wildest fiction. <laughs> and so to me, to me, you know, these books don't seem as much a, de a, a, a departure as it might seem to the reader because I've always sort of um, been on the extreme ends of reality um, to begin with. That said, to me, writing this book and going back to myths and folklore, I guess it's like, it's, it's like I guess, if you're a rock and roll musician, eventually you have to go back to the blues. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's, and I think for me, I, knew, I, don't, I know for me, I, I, been, I knew I had to go back at some point and make sense of that and try to spin something out of that. Um, before I could go, you know, go forward again. So it it feels to me like a natural evolution, um, as opposed to say uh, a stark turn, um, you know. But it's it's yeah. There there's still aspects of of the storytelling that remain. Like I'm still very much interested in voice. I'm still very much interested in first person, mm -hmm. and I'm also very much interested in in um, re the reliability and the unreliability of a character who's telling telling the story, which having done the research, I realize couldn't be more African. It couldn't be more in time, you know, with the whole folkloric tradition. Wonderful. Are there particular writers that uh, inspired you when you were growing up and have inspired you over the course of your writing career? Yeah, I mean, growing up, I think the most inspiring writers for me when I was growing up were comics writers, actually. Mm -hmm. um, Chris Claremont, who used to write X-Men in the 80s. Yeah. And X-Men had a profound impact on me. I always thought people reading X-Men was a lot like being an X-Man. Um, because most of the people who read X-Men were nerds or freaks <laughs> or geeks. And X-Men were the freak, the freak nerd group, you know, saving the world that didn't like them. And they're, you know, doing doing homework help for kids who didn't like me uh, yeah, trying to be trying to be cool and trying to be popular um so that but but it struck it, there's a lot about that that world and that universe that struck me which is why and i still think that's why i i, I find myself drawn to fantastical stories um it's one of the reasons why you know buffy the vampire slayer is my favorite tv show you know pretty much of all time because i think that fantasy universe gives you a way to get into gut truths about people. And I think that's one of the things that comics taught me. Um, but, you know, so the other thing about when I was growing up is books weren't that easy to come by. There was a library and so on, but not really. So I didn't, I, I didn't, I didn't develop a kind of snobbish attitude towards books. I tell people, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a literary snob because I couldn't afford it. <clears throat> yeah, to me, <clears throat> sorry, to me, the only category I needed for a new book was that it was next. So I read anything. I read anything I could get my hands on, and they all influenced me in one way or another. I had a, you know, I had a, lots of fun with James Clavell. 
which may not be the most politically correct choice to read these days. Hmm. Uh, you know, I adored Jackie Collins. <laughs> uh, Hollywood Wives was a major turning point in my reading life. Um, I came across Gabriel Garcia Marquez because somebody in the comparative lit class before mine was very unfortunate to leave the book in the class. So I took it. And if you're watching this, I'm very sorry, whoever that was, <laughs> whose, whose comparative lit book I stole. And I was I was shocked by it. I was almost appalled by it. Um, it's when I read Salman Rushdie's Shame. I was appalled by that novel because I didn't know you could take these liberties with English. Um, growing up in a very British colonial education, you're taught to fear language. Um, you're taught that you are supposed to be subordinate to the language. You are The language is supposed to use you. So seeing people playing with words, seeing people reclaiming mythology, seeing people like, like Salman deliberately playing with verbosity, um, almost as a sly laugh at British English, I was shocked. And it completely changed and influenced how I read and definitely how, how I wrote. Um, and you know, to, to wrap up the question, I mean, the 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 you know the the god of everything I do, of course, is Toni Morrison. Um, somebody asked me once if I think I'd ever get over her influence. I'm like, why would I even try? <laughs> it's like I don't want to leave it. I do not want to leave her influence at all, ever. Because um, Toni Morrison taught me, you know, one that how much. How much of your story depends on how much you trust your characters to tell it. You mentioned that uh, your parents were police mm -hmm. employees. Did, yeah. So how did you come to writing? Um, you know, did, did you learn anything from them that influenced your writing? Not really. They were cops, but they were also they were both readers. Um, I, you know, the first time I read O. Henry was my mom's collection of O. Henry short stories uh first time i read shakespeare was my father reading shakespeare's sonnets mm. and, and um and julius caesar in particular um the you know back in the day the 50s 60s my mom kept all those books readers digest used to put out these compendium of all their short stories and excerpts every year so it wasn't until i'm in, you know in my 20s 30s even now i'm like Hold on, I read that Hemingway story. Um, so it was it was a situation where there were there were there weren't a lot of books, but the books are available, mm -hmm. and uh, they were open for anybody who wanted to read them. And I think that's what that was the primary influence. I mean, to me, literature is a form of detective work. You know, you are you are solving a mystery, and my mom actually was a detective. Um, she was the first female cop to make detective. So I think there's there's some of that where I think um, for me, literature is, well, writing at least, is, um, you know, a detective work where you're uncovering things that somebody may not necessarily want to tell you. And have uh, one more question for you here. Mm -hmm. uh, it says, the settings, characters, and actions seem so realistic and vivid. Did you spend time in Africa or is it from research and imagination? It's all, it's all the above. I haven't been to, I haven't been to Africa in, in quite a bit, actually. Last time I was on the continent, I was in Nigeria. I was in Abia Kuta, um, which is actually one of these sort of bedrock cradle points of, of, of um, African civilization, which I didn't even know when I was there, sadly. So I haven't been, I haven't been to, I haven't been to the continent since 2013. Um, so there is that. So so there is some of that that first hand experience. But of course, a lot of it is research. A lot of it is tons and tons of of books. And you have to be careful because honestly, if it's a history book about Africa written before 1976, it's probably useless. Um, especially if it was written by Europeans. But particularly if it was written by Europeans, it's pretty useless other than to get a good laugh. Um so, and but there's also a lot of contemporary work being done. I, you know, so I did a lot of that, but I also have to remember I'm writing a fantasy novel, you know, and, and that um, I'm still writing about impossible things. I'm writing about cities that float and I'm writing about people that fly and so on. So I still had to leave enough, uh, enough to the, the sort of the fantastical, enough to 
imagine. So yeah, if it were a historical novel, I think I would have paid more attention to that sort of thing. But it being make believe, it becomes a combination of research, things I made up, things I discovered, and you know, things I things I found. And one more really quick question: Somebody asked whether you would consider adding illustrations to your fiction, a la Dickens or the graphic novel Moss. I, you know what, it's funny because I was a graphic designer and I was an <laughs> illustrator. And, and and the sad thing is I can illustrate everything but my own stuff. I have a block when it comes to me. So I would actually, um, maybe in, in, in later editions of it. I would do it, I would, I, would, I would only do it in later editions, primarily because I think illustrations can be great, but they can also run the risk of limiting somebody's imagination. Um, I love the Lord of the Rings films. But until the Lord of the Ring, until the film came out, if there were 10 million readers of Lord of the Rings, there were 10 million Frodo's. No, there's only one. <laughs> <laughs> no, everybody read the book and it's Elijah Wood. No, there's only one. So I would, I would definitely consider it, but I think it would be a later edition of each book. Well, on behalf of the James Merrill House, wanted to thank you for your time today, Marlon. It's been a privilege and a pleasure and uh, love the readings today. We look forward to welcoming you, welcoming you to Stonington in October. Very excited to have you. Mm -hmm. uh, so we will see you soon. And on behalf of the James Merrill House, thank you to our audience. You can follow the James Merrill House on Facebook and Twitter and visit us at jamesmerrillhouse.org. Uh, happy May Day to everyone and uh, Happy Kentucky Derby Day. I believe post time is in about 45 minutes. So uh, have a good evening, everyone. Thank you very much. And thank you, Marlon. Thank you so much for having me. The first writers and residents came to the James Merrill House 25 years ago, shortly after James Merrill's death in 1995. Since then, over 80 writers have visited staying in his home, a national historic landmark to work on projects of their own. Thanks to Merrill's generosity, the house now belongs to the Stonington Village Improvement Association and is an ongoing inspiration for writers and poets from around the world. For more information, visit our website, jamesmerrillhouse.org. Thank you. So, hi. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Bergen. It is uh, lovely to see the James Merrill hidden study of 107 uh, behind you. It's very nostalgic. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Thanks so much. So this is um, this is my my new book. It's called The Math Campers. Uh, my own novel. Uh, it's called These Women. It looks like this. Well, the first thing I'll say is all the dreams are actual dreams. Um, there's nothing worse than a fabricated dream. You can always tell. I normally don't write in first person because of the fact that as soon as you have a narrator, you tend to have somebody listening, or there's an implied audience. I just got to soak up in the atmosphere in that house. You just feel like a writer and you feel like you're part of this um, tradition in a community and it feels like the work is important. Magical things happen when you're looking at Meryl's books. Well, it was a really, really transformative uh, residence for me. Um, it, that's, it might sound like a bit of an overstatement, but it, it, it really wasn't. Merrill's really distinct imagination was present Thanks. in every detail. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> Bye. Enjoy Stonington on my behalf.